Good evening. My name is Berit Ebert and I'm the Vice President of Programs here at the Academy in Berlin. And I welcome everyone to the Daimler Lecture, Harun Faroki, Forms of Intelligence Between Text and Image by Nora Alter, who is a professor at Temple University School of Theater, Film and Media Arts at, and the Academy Spring 2021 Daimler Fellow. Um, so we're extremely grateful for Daimler to support this fellowship and to bring such excellent people as Nora here to the American Academy. This evening um, wouldn't be possible without a very important person um, here with us tonight, and this is Gertrud Koch. Gertrud Koch has the task, has pretty much two very important tasks today. First, she will introduce Nora, and then she will moderate the Q&A following Nora's lecture. And I have the pleasure of introducing Gertrud Koch, which is actually very difficult because Gertrud doesn't need an introduction at all because of course everyone knows her, but I will nevertheless give it a try. Um, all of you know that uh, Gertrud is a professor of film studies at Free University of Berlin and one of the founders of the feminist film theory. Pretty much everyone in this world refers to Gertrud as la grande dame of film theory. Um, we're extremely honored and grateful that you're here with us um, tonight. Gertrud uh, significantly influenced the development and establishment of film studies at the Federal Republic of Germany, a development which occurred in parallel to the theoretical formations in the USA and England, with which it always uh, was in extensive exchange. And Gertrud Koch's work is, an, is exemplary of this exchange. Um, Gertrud Koch has taught at many international universities and was a research fellow at the Getty Center at the University of Pennsylvania and at the Kogut Center for Humanities at Brown University, where she is also a visiting fellow. Um, now my task becomes really difficult because now I'm supposed to summarize her monographs, articles and volumes she has edited. This is a task that is simply impossible. So I will give you a brief highlight here. Um, uh, her monographs include Her Herbert Marcuse zur Einführung, Herbert Marcuse an introduction, which she uh, wrote together with Hauke Brunkhorst and which was published in 1987. I'll jump and leave a few monographs out. And um, then in 1996, she published Siegfried Krakauer zur Einführung, Siegfried Krakauer an introduction, which was also published um, in English with Princeton University Press in 2000. And um, pretty recently, she published Die Wiederkehr der Illusion with Sue Kamp in 2016. Um, Gertrud also serves as co-editor of Babylon, Frauen und Film. She's an editorial and advisory board member for several magazines, including October, Constellations, as well as Philosophy and Social Criticism and Zeitschrift für Sexualwissenschaft. Um, as I said, I will. Uh, I have to stop at some point, and this is the point. <laughs> um, uh, Gertrud has a has a wonderful pa um, homepage at Free University. Look it up. Um, you will be. Um, everyone knows it, but to be impressed again, look it up and uh, see what what she has done. We're extremely delighted to have you here with us tonight, Gertrud. And before I hand over to you, I will just briefly explain um, the Zoom etiquette of tonight. Um, so, um, we will, um, have Nora's lecture right now, then, um, Gertrud will moderate the Q and A and we accordingly invite everyone to ask questions. And you can also ask questions as Nora speaks, um, for, um, in order to ask questions, please use the Q and A function, which you will see on the bottom of your screen. Um, Gertrud, thank you so much for being here with us and the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to, uh, I hope to fulfill this uh, splendid task to present Nora Alter and her lecture. Um, Nora Alter is uh, uh, well known in cinema studies and also in comparative, com comparative literature in German studies. Actually, um, she started with uh, uh, comparative liter literature and uh, um, one of her first books uh, was interestingly enough dedicated to theater, to theater um, concerning the Vietnam War. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, Nora from the beginning uh, was uh, very much attracted to issues that would bind these questions of the art and politics together. 
in a way that uh, uh, also is characteristic for Harun Faroqi's work, by the way. Um, Nora Alter had uh, uh, several chairs and she uh, uh, went from um, Florida, from Gainesville, um, University of Gainesville in Florida, and is now a professor of comparative film and media studies in the School of Theater, Film and Media Arts at Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, she is also was for long periods the chair of the Film and Media um, Arts Department and still is the head of the Venice program where she is doing very interesting work uh, with students also during the Biennale. Uh, so that shows that Nora from a very distinct point up um, uh, switched a bit to research on questions more about uh, the visual arts in general and uh, the way film and video are becoming part of the visual arts. And uh, this move, I think, is very important uh, to understand her, I mean, recent works and uh, uh, a lot of essays. Uh, the last book was uh, um, the essay film After Fact and Fiction, where again, you can see from the subject that she is really developing in a very, very illuminating way um, in this forms like the essay film that gives insights in political thoughts and aesthetic problems of presentation and representation. So this idea that thinking and political thinking and political thought um, is not the other side from the art, but that they are deeply overlapping, so to say, um, is uh, one of the, um, the programmatic aspects in, uh, in Nora's work. And uh, also her essays are very often dealing with artists who are in this field of uh, video essays, essay film, um, posing this question. Um, so she always uh, found some new subjects also before she went to Harun Faroqi. Um, that were, I mean, looking for, let's say, gaps and uh, uh, frictions in the field of research. For example, one of her books with collected essays um, is dealing with the problem of sound in film, a problem that is very often overlooked or, you know, just, I mean, departmentalized. So musicologists would uh, write about uh, music in film and sound studies would uh, uh, grab a little bit, um, but in film studies itself, it was not so much elaborated. And so Nora found a way to bring this question anew um, on the front door of cinema studies. And um, in, from her time where she was uh, uh, working also in German studies, she was also, I think, one of the leading figures in a famous group called Women in German Studies or something like this, I guess, um, where she was uh, uh, doing very interesting work, especially on uh, um, questions of feminism and uh, 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 films made by women. And she had also a book on this uh, um, issue, Projecting History, Nonfiction German Film, you see, it's always on the non-fictional side, knowing that aesthetic presentation representations always have a fictional side, but it's not, let's say, binding her work on a genre like fiction or non-fiction. So the essay film in many ways uh, is already a medium of reflection. And I think what Nora will present this evening is a very similar approach um, in a filmic work or in the work of a filmmaker um, who has all his lifetime thought about this frictions between thinking and picturing and wording. And I think it's time now for Nora to um, give us a lecture so that we have something to discuss. Nora, please. Thank you, Barrett, for introducing us. And thank you very much, Gertrude, for your extremely generous um, introduction. I'm sorry that I can't actually 
look at you and thank you in person. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for zooming in to my lecture. My computer indicates that you are many. However, this lecture room that normally holds about 75 is empty. The effect of this form of intellectual performance reminds me of a passage from Harun Faroqi in which he was comparing differences inherent in the transmission of different media he had worked in, film, television, art exhibition. He wrote, quote, the cinema business makes the premiere of a film an event in each city. The sense of an event increases when one takes part in a museum or gallery exhibition. When a work of mine is shown on television, it is as if I have thrown a message in a bottle into the sea, and in order to imagine the viewer, I have to invent him or her completely. Well, maybe I don't have to imagine all of you or invent you completely, since there are some names that I recognize. But like the man in the crowd, I miss your live presence, the subtle responses registered to my words and your expressions, gestures, and poses, furrowed brows, smiles, and eye contact. Before I begin, I wanna thank the American Academy for supporting my project and providing me with this amazing opportunity to reside here and carry out my research despite the COVID restrictions. But I also want especially to acknowledge and express my deepest gratitude to individuals who have helped and assisted me in so many ways along the way by supplying me with films, text, unpublished material, and have served as important interlocutors over the years. These include Tom Hollert and Volker Pattenberg of the Harun Faroqi Institute, Marius Babios at the Neue Berliner Kunstverein, and Ancha Amon, who has so generously opened up Faroqi's personal archives and has responded so quickly and speedily to my every query and request. Thank you. In 1986, Harun Faroqi applied for funding for a never realized 16 millimeter, 70 minute color film, hypothetically titled On the History of Labor. That, as he put it, should produce enough surprising and therefore informative image image or word image or word word relationships to fill an evening. Here, Faroqi presents three possibilities of how images and words or text may be placed into constellations with each other in order to make a film. For Faroqi, words and images are conceptualized as separate building blocks or bricks, following Ziga Bertov, who famously wrote that film truth is made of material as a house is made of bricks. Using bricks, one can make an oven, the Kremlin wall, and many other things. Single bricks are carefully placed together, resulting in myriad architectural structures. This process of brick building is the topic of Faroqi's 2009 In Comparison, which surveys different sites of brick fabrication from around the world, from handmade artisanal practices to advanced computer assembly lines. The analogy to filmmaking and In Comparison is clear as the medium has evolved from single shot celluloid productions to digital multi-screen compilations. But unlike the material bricks, which are normally comprised of a uniformity of material, the substance of Faroqi's filmic bricks are both words and images. Words and images, both separately and in relationship to each other, can constitute phrases out of which an audiovisual text will be assembled. In what follows, I want to tease out some of the constructions of words and images in Faroqi's oeuvre and suggest that many of the seeds of what will be of central concern in Faroqi's later filmic works are already present in his early writings. In order to do so, I need to go back to the beginning. Before he was a filmmaker, Faroqi wanted to be a writer. The importance of his development and conceptual of himself as an author cannot be underestimated. And from the outside, he distinguished himself from many of his contemporaries as someone who conjoined his film plexus with the text plexus. 
This included not only written essay counterparts to his films, but numerous reviews and articles on diverse topics, ranging from theories of pedagogy and cybernetics to literature and history, media, archeology, span film analysis, and cultural critique. In his cumulative output, num his cumulative output numbers some 220 odd texts and essays, and are now available to us through the tireless efforts of the Harun Faroki Institute in collaboration with the Neue Berliner Kunstverein. Starting in 1964, after he completed his high school equivalency or Abitur at night school in Berlin, Faroki contributed regular op-eds to the cultural section of the left-leaning Spandauer Volksblatt. His first essay, Seid ihr bereit, Are You Prepared?, analyzes the former East German youth initiation ritual, Jungenbeye, and was published under the name Harun Farouki. Other early pieces are penned by Harun Farouki and Harun Farouki. After a trip to Central and Latin America in the summer of 1967, he wrote four articles on revolutionary po politics, including Revolution of Castro and Company and Guerrillas on a Trost, a review of Sergi Dupré's Revolution in the Revolution, which appeared under the pseudonym Franz Putz. Faroki did not settle on the spelling of his name Faroki until 1969. From 1975 to 1985, Faroki served on the editorial board of Film Critique, contributing almost to every issue. Indeed, it was this role that brought visibility to Faroki and attracted the attention of other film writers and critics outside of Germany. Thomas L. Sasser recalls that he first sought out Faroki in the 1970s because of his reputation as a writer and not as a filmmaker. Faroki's films were relatively unknown and practically inaccessible outside of Germany until his breakthrough work, Images of the World and the Inscription of War, of War from 1988. After Faroki resigned from the Board of Film Critique, he continued as a freelance writer. From 1994 onwards, he was a regular contributor to the French journal Trafic, and in 1998, he co-authored a book of critical essays speaking about Godard with Kaja Silverman. In the last decade of his career, his pace of writing only increased as he contributed pithy essays to catalogs, international journals, and edited volumes. Just prior to his death, he was working on an autobiography, 10, 20, 30, 40, a skillfully crafted text that accounts to significant events in Faroki's life. Divided into decades, it offers a portrait of the trials and tribulations of an independent filmmaker in a fast changing media environment and provides an exceptional glimpse into the practice of everyday life in the vibrant alternative cultural mecca of West Berlin. Faroki's early essays often began as reviews of contemporary literature that quickly morphed into broader commentaries and critiques of contemporary society. For example, in Selbstmord, Suicide of 1964, a review on a new edition of Collective Poems by Mayakovsky, he launches into a discussion about the marketing strategy of publishers who decide to issue a series in a rainbow of colors with the express idea that potential buyers will want to purchase all the volumes, regardless of their authors or subject matter, out of the desire to have a complete set. In this particular instance, Faroki selects number 62 by Sokamp, a red volume at Mayakovsky's edited works that includes the poem on Sergei Yeltsinson, who committed suicide. The poem foreshadows Mayakovsky's own suicide a few years later at the age of 36. Faroki intertwines his discussion of the young poet with biting observations on the contemporary commodification of culture and his clever packaging. He observes how the outer packaging of the Mayakovsky volume hides the damage done by the editors who have willy-nilly pieced together samples and extracts from the author's oeuvre. Such extraction and sorting out, curating, is a violent act. And Faroki concludes, when horses are chopped up, songbirds canned, and dogs beaten, help is close at hand. But who helps poor Mayakovsky, who has been beaten, chopped up, and 
spectralize, as in specter a ghost. Self the brutality of the literary editorial process that Faroki describes already in 1964, prior to his becoming a filmmaker, will resonate with his later critique of the work of TV editors, editors Kutterin, in the 1970s. In one of his several lengthy tracks from the 70s on the hidden labor that takes place in television studios, he pronounces, the work done at the editing station is one of covering up, smoothing over and salvaging meaning. Since there is no overarching understanding or possibility for independent expression or articulation, the work of an editor is reduced to that of a mere technical assistant who organizes and labels the material. Images that previously had no connections are brought together in false alliances and equivalencies. They, are, they serve merely to illustrate a preconceived commentary or text that does not emerge out of the sounds and images, but is rather imposed on them. Just as Surkamp provides an aesthetically appealing package for their writer's text, so too television delivers its generic programs in a superficial gloss that both manipulates and occludes truth. In addition to literary reviews, Faroki's early writings take up myriad topics like old cars, news media, copy production, and exploitation in the third world. In the aptly titled Manipuliotis Wahrheit, Manipulated Reality from 1964, Faroki compares the delivery of news to that of a drug dealer. Just as the dependency of, morphine, of the morphine addict rose steadily, so must the dose delivered by the Springer company daily increase. Media mogul Axel Springer being the forebearer of Rupert Murdoch on a national scale. Hiroki had a canny insight into how the commercial press and media depend on savvy marketing and advertising strategies to deliver a product, whether it be culture, news, current events, or eye-catching stories. In their presentation, differences are elided and everything is pitched at and to the same level. Four years later, in 1968, Faroki takes up the topic in his show, Ihre Zeitungen, Their Newspapers, in which he sharply criticizes newspapers that equivocate a local gory crime with the systematic bombing by the US of Vietnam. Like the filmmakers of Far From Vietnam, released the year before, Faroki asks, how can the horrors of Vietnam be made to be relevant in West Germany? Certainly not in the way the news is delivered. Further, he is critical of a hotline that has been established ostensibly for citizens to provide journalists with crime tips, which as, she as he shows, quickly devolves into forming against left radicals and protesters. Over two decades later, in 1986, Faroki returns again to his critique of newspapers in catchphrases, catch images, a conversation with Willem Flusser. In this instance, Faroki and Flusser carefully analyze and decode the images and texts of the front page from November 26, 1985 of the sensationalist tabloid Build, um, not coincidentally a Springer production. Flusser is introduced by Faroki as the author of two important texts, Towards a Philosophy of Photography from 1983 and Into the Universe of Technical Images from 1985. As he summarizes, for Willem Flusser, photography as, is as equally profound an invention as print. With photography, the development of technical images began, film and electronic images, computer graphics. Faroki and Flusser are then presented sitting at a small table in a cafe. Faroki pulls out, pulls out the bill paper and the two of them lean over it to examine it carefully. Flusser outlines that conventionally when images and texts appear together, either the image illustrates the text or the text explains the image. However, in the cover design of Build, a new relationship occurs. In this instance, the text works as a function of the image and the image as a function of the text, and the two keep each other in check. Thus, one portion of the paper has a photograph of a dead body 
cut out in such a way that an arm cuts into the space allocated for the text, thereby functioning like a word. Further, they observe the letters, instead of being black against a white background, are the opposite, rendering them an imagistic quality. Blisser remarks, quote, writing is a code to criticize and consider. It, it, writing is linearly developing a diachronic message which should synchronize our gaze. When we synchronize a dia diachrony, we criticize the event. Therefore, writing is a code of critical thinking. But here it has been reversed into the opposite. Writing is a mode, into, is made into an image. Okay. They then move on to another story located towards the bottom of the page, that of a woman and child who have been murdered. As they know, you can't undergo semantic analysis until you look at the entire totality of the page. The idea of totality and the part echoes with Faroqui's earlier pronouncement on how texts and images are used in publishing and television alike. They're extracted, brutally cut out of their context and continuum. Faroqui's interest in economic theory is present in his earliest writings. He came of age during the heights of the rebuilding of West Germany and its Wirtschaftswunder economic miracle and was cleanly, keenly critical of the deleterious effects of the consumer culture and the logic of advertising. One of his early reviews, Glanz und Elend auf vier Reden, der Sport in unser Landschaft, Shine in Misery on Four Wheels, Scrap Metal in Our Landscape, sardonically attacks the new Wegburg Disposable Society. In it, he describes the fate of a 1954 Buick, which only a decade old has already been abandoned. Previously, he writes, previously old cars were cannibalized, their metal was melted down and people did not throw their cars into the field every spring. There are about 200 vehicles which expire every day. Those cars who were made between 1950 and 55 are left to die because these were weak years. Once the generation of the 60s has died, there will be no one left to recycle the raw material. The disposable fate of cars becomes a metaphor for Faroqui to engage in a critique of West German society in which little is preserved from these initial post-war years. Instead of fixing or repairing cars barely a decade old or even melting them down for their metal, they are rusting in car cemeteries, cast off without value. He concludes, a car cemetery is nothing but the final proof of a prosperous society. The waste of labor and goods, a byproduct of capitalist society will be central to Faroqui's filmmaking practice in which he constantly recycles and self cannibalizes from previous work. During the sixties, Faroqui was a voracious reader and in 1965, he reviewed Roland Barthes newly translated Myth Today. Barth's understanding of the way in which myth and ideology work together in cultural production was to have a sustained impact on Faroqui's thought. As Faroqui notes, the way the world is seen here also appears in details if one believes the popular view. The bourgeois, fascist, and capitalist ideology is not recognizable today by the label. You have to track it down in details, in expressions and gestures. To recall, in this volume of collected essays, Bath subjects a variety of topics and dissects them from French fries to Billy Graham to Garbo's face to a photo of a black cadet saluting the French flag on the cover of Paris Match to a rigorous semiotic analysis that explains the mystification that transforms petit bourgeois culture into universal nature. Faroqui concludes his review with one can only hope that with this collection, Bach will produce a model for ideology critique. And this model of ideology critique will differ from that offered by Benjamin, Brecht, Kako, and Adorno in its focus on contemporary myth that, quote, hides nothing. Its function is to distort and not make disappear. As I discuss elsewhere in my project, Faroqui brings together both Frankfurt School critique and French structuralist and situationist thought. Brecht serves as a linchpin between the two schools of thought. Myth or culture appears natural and eternal 
and it is the astute critic to denaturalize them. Parocchi no doubt recognizes Bach's correspondence with his own observations when the latter critiqued the naturalness with which newspapers, art, and common sense constantly dress up reality, which is undoubtedly determined by history. Significantly, it is in mythologies that Bach, in the final essay, Myth Today, introduces the distinction between operational language and meta-language that will later influence Parocchi's theorization of the operational image. Bach writes, and I quote, here we must go back to the distinction between language object and meta-language. If I am a woodcutter and I am led to name the tree that I am felling, whatever the term of my sentence, I speak the tree. I do not speak about it, about it. This means that my language is operational, transitively linked to its object. But if I am not a woodcutter, I can no longer speak the tree. I can only speak about it, on it. Compared to the real language of the woodcutter, the language I create is a second order language, a meta language. 40 years later, in 2005, when discussing his I Machine series, Baroque refers to operative images. He explains, I have called such images that are not made to entertain or to inform operative images, images that are not simply meant to reproduce something, but instead are part of the operation. In his essay, War Always Finds a Way of 2005, with its citation to Brecht in the title, Hiroki traces his use of the term operational to Barth's discussion in Myth Today and quotes directly from the French semiotician's distinction between operational language and meta-language cited above. Time does not permit me to go into Hiroki's use of operational images from those taken by bombs to surveillance cameras, and this has been well covered territory by recent Baroque critics. What I wanna underscore here rather is that already in 1965, Baroque was thinking about how to translate Bartz's division of language into operational and meta into images. And it is surely not coincidental that half a century later in his study on the genealogy of computer imagery in parallel one, he, like Bach, a myth today begins with a tree. A tree is a tree, tracing its development historically from nonfiction to becoming an active part of the games. Parochi's first film review, Hoffman Ja Antonioni 9, Hoffman Yes Antonioni No, was published in the germ journal Film Critic, Critique the most important critical publication in West German cinema in the 1960s. Once he became a student, he wrote more systematically on films and media theory, publishing reviews and film. As one tracks his writings during the first decade, certain themes and interests crystallize that will surface in the films, such as theories of media, images, advertising, Marxism, labor, architecture, and pedagogy. Faroki was reading a wide range of material, processing and integrating it into his writerly and filmic practices. Sometimes the connection between his writing and filmmaking is indirect, such as in the early 70s when he began his teaching to, create, to career and he was avidly reading books on radical pedagogy and incorporating some of the strategies into films such as The Division of All Days from 1970 and something self-explanatory 15 times from 1971. In the case of the former, he set up a classroom situation in which Faroki, as seminar leader, would quote from Marx and promote a discussion. He would then have the students watch a short learning film skit on the topic. The effect was perhaps overly pedantic and it was not clear what this film offered that reading the original text did not. The following year, in something self-explanatory, he adopted a new strategy that only consisted of short skits that comically addressed several of Marx's tenets on capital. In the case of both these films, Parocchi's thoughts about the relationship between politics, pedagogy, and filmmaking is addressed in essays such as Die Agitation Wissenschaftlichen und die Wissenschaft Politisierung from 1969, or Die Russe und die Egg from 1969 also, or Capital in the Classroom from 1971. 
These correspondences between Perroquet's theoretical essays and his films is oblique, and each are discrete units. In contrast, for beginning in 1968, Perroquet uses his writing more directly to connect with his films. Thus, he first published the essay, Vacuum Cleaner or Machine Gun, a year before and in and anticipation of the release of his first feature, An Extinguishable Fire, in 1969. This calculated promotional strategy continued, whereby each of his major films, he wrote essays detailing his historic research, publishing the scenarios, and even once staging a mock interview about the film with an imaginary interviewer, Rosa Mercedes. For example, for his film Between Two Wars of 1978, he published no less than six separate essays on the film, including Das große Verbindungsbau, Zwischen zwei Kriegen, Filmentwurf, Zwischen zwei Kriegen, Anzeige, Über Zwischen zwei Kriegen, and Notizen zur Aufregung von Rätel, Franz Jung, und andere, and Notiz zu Zwischen zwei Kriegen. These writings are for the most part repetitive with slight variations. However, what they reveal as a whole is the extent to which Faroke became obsessed with the topic and was intent on showing how his work, his work process as a filmmaker was akin to that of a researcher or historian who delves deep into the archives, mining them for as many resources as possible. What is revealed through his writings is the amount of labor invested in an 85 minute film. It is worth noting that Faroki stresses in the credits that Between Two Wars was made over the years between 1971 and 1977. So six years for 85 minutes. In order to understand and re render the full complexity of the historical conditions, Faroki sought to extract meaning from as many sources as possible circumventing the possibility that his film would be rendered as meaningless as a photograph of a Klux factory that reveals nothing about the socio-economic operations that take place behind its walls. Instead, what Parochi makes visible in both the film Between Two Wards and his essays are those operations and relations occluded by master narratives and their images. And he achieves this with both his writing and his moving images. Faroki's writings must be understood then as one part of his audiovisual production. The recto to the verso or following Walter Benjamin, they function as extended captions to the film. Faroki thus produces a diptych consisting of text and moving images that coexist separately but may be brought together to form Faroki's own Verbund system or integrated working system where nothing is left to waste. As is indicated in his writings through the 70s, Faroki is still quite dependent on written or spoken language as a medium through which to express critical thought. However, increasingly, he seeks to find a way to rely on images to produce some meaning. In order to explore this possibility, he studies photography. In his 1979 film, Industry and Photography, he states that images speak for themselves. And with unstaged amateur photographs, images that are poorer have more to say. Two years later, his film, View of the City from 1981, he examines a book of photographs of Berlin architecture in which the photos are exhibited without captions. They are carefully juxtaposed one against the other, carefully montaged together like frames of a film. However, instead of the linear succession dictated by film, they coexist on the same spatial plane. Broki then asks the question, how do images argue? Just over 30 years later, in one of his final interviews, Baroki states, in all modesty, I've tried to find means in which not only additional words shape the idea of cinematography's discourse, but somehow the shape, the montage, the form of film constitutes to it. It can sound a little bit poetic to say, having images that think and having films that think. But it's, in this, but it's in this sense is one of my ambitions to find some autonomy in the cinematographic form 
in which you don't just repeat things which already exist on paper and try to translate them into film form, but you try to give some autonomy to the cinematic medium. Images and by extension films that think relate philosophically to German aesthetic theory, going back to Hegel, Herder, Schelling and others that was later taken up most famously by Benjamin and Adorno and their concept of the dank build or thought image. The thought image is a short hybrid text that combines literature, philosophy, journalism and art. A dank build creates an image built out of words in ways which it says, which cannot be said in other ways. If the thought image produces images out of words, then as he matures, Faroki takes this concept one step further through a careful reversal and creates words and thoughts out of the image. No longer just words and words or images and words, but images and images. Thank you. Uh, that uh, gave us a lot of uh, new materials that may not really well known uh, because they are basically sitting in the archive. And uh, so for me, it was very interesting that you really draw a big line from the 70s and late 60s uh, to um, the late uh, Farocchi. And uh, in uh, some regard, you describe it as a kind of Bildungsroman. <laughs> You know how Faraki himself um, adjusted his own poetics um, in this uh, uh, um, discussions about the role of language, and it reminded me on another bar text that was very much at stake at this time. Uh, this was the famous uh, lecture uh, Roland Barth gave uh, at, uh, gave at the Collège de France in seventy seven. Um, on its called lection. Um, and there he uh, uh, says uh, the performance of language, what means the practice of language, um, is in itself fascistic, fascist, uh, because, and this is his argument, um, it either uh, makes identif identifying assertions. Um, and it's based on repetition. And uh, so in his further development of the argument, he says what the only thing that can, I mean, break out of this uh, 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 fascist uh, uh, condition of language um, is for him writing uh, what he calls literature. And so it would be very interesting for me to see um, if uh, Farocchi reflects, even if he is not quoting this te special text, uh, this moment of what does happen to words and images that are entirely commodified in the capitalist use of language, so to say, um, when one uh, is developing uh, this relationship into a poetics uh, that would come nearer to what uh, uh, Bach called uh, let's say the counter uh, poison uh, to the fascist use of language and the fascist moment in language as language is repetitive and by grammar, as he said, it forces us to speak. Uh, it, it's not that we are speaking the language, but the language is speaking us, the famous uh, uh, Lacan uh, phrase. So in so far, one could argue uh, that maybe this uh, pictorial turn that in Farocchi's work was also turned into the visual arts. Uh, maybe is also already related to this language skepticism and the kind of iconoclastic tradition uh, that was uh, uh, rather important for this kind of, you know, arte povera moment uh, that Farocchi also um, celebrates for his films. So I wonder if you could say um, some more about this and then we open surely the discussion. Um, okay, thank you. That's an excellent um, point and question and it brings up quite a few different ways that one can go with it. Um, first of all, I mean, it's just interesting that because between 
myth today and um, the lecture, there's almost 20 years, right? So there's a significant shift in Bach's um, positioning and thought processes uh, during those kind of two decades. Um, but I mean, I think that it does relate to a really important issue about the shift to the pictorial, but also the response to language that and the continuation of the suspicion of a type of official language and phrases or what Bach at one point calls a denaturalized language, denatured language, and its relationship to operational language. And here, this is where I haven't quite figured um, things out yet. So this is sort of kind of a work in progress, but what the other source for Farocchi on operation images and operational language is Tretiakov. He goes back to Tretiakov who talks precisely about these sort of stock phrases, almost cliches, political speeches that one finds um, in Soviet newspapers in the 20s and 30s. So it's specifically in journalism, hence its interest for Farocchi. And he says that, you know, with one phrase, everybody knows what it means. With two words, it builds into a much larger whole. It transports with it. So to that, and that's what Tretiakov refers to as a kind of operational language. And somebody like Devin Four has written um, about this, I think, in October. And I think that Faoki is really interested in that because he sees this sort of importing of language or the taking of the cliche as very similar. I mean, he's writing about this at the same time that he's acquainting himself with the intricate details of what a film editor does mm -hmm. and if for TV um, and how when the film editor is sitting there and it happens usually to be a she, she has to find images. It's almost like directly plucking them out of like, oh, the example he uses is um, free time. So free time becomes that image of people in a Ferris wheel or leisure time on a Sunday is illustrated by somebody holding a plate of kuchen or something, serving a plate of kuchen. So he says, you know, there become these like, images that they use as a data bank of images, as an archive of images. So it'd be like, I would just reach behind me, grab one of these books and say, oh, okay, this is gonna be wind or this is tree. So I think that there's part of that is going on and then, okay, well, how does one somehow, because he keeps talking, he actually uses the word several times, save. Mm -hmm. How does one save these images or save this language? Is it possible to actually have them speak? Mm -hmm. And quite early on, he says, when he's analyzing um, certain TV documentaries, he repeats the images over and over and over again. And he says, it's through that process of repeating that slowly their voices can be heard, that slowly they can actually begin to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that really answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting because it is, has a different idea of what repetition is. Mm -hmm. Or why repetition for Farocchi means that, uh, um, you know, through repetition, uh, things change, so to say, their expression. So they become uh, more visible or more audible. And uh, so in, in Bach's famous saying, uh, repetition is much more kind of mechanic repetition uh, that stems, so to say, a meaning to all the speakers who repeat the word. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that, and I think it comes back to this uh, quote you put on the beginning with the bricks, because the bricks also are, I mean, kind of uniform um, units but the way you perform with them makes it into something new. 
But mm -hmm. uh, um, I realize that we have already some questions and maybe we just uh, start to collect them. Um, Nora, if you are ready, I just would read sure. um, the um, first question. It's from Adam Lowenstein. And he has a following question. Who are the other filmmakers you would group with Paroki in terms of a similarly profound impact related to the Vietnam War on their thinking and practice? Perhaps fiction filmmakers as well as documentary filmmakers. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. So would you um, answer this directly? Um, sure. So, I mean, I did cite from the omnibus production, Far From Vietnam, which involved Godard, Rene, Marker, Agnes Varda, Joris Evans, um, Claude Lelouch, and I think William Klein. I can't remember all the names mm -hmm. um, from that time period. Um, so I would say that Faroki was definitely influenced by that group of filmmakers. Um, and then there were documentary filmmakers such as um, D'Antonio who did Vietnam, Year of the Pig. Um, what else was there? Just trying to think out loud. Uh, these are not on the tip of my, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my tongue right now, but um, I could certainly, there's certainly many more of them as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, that's uh, definitely, I think, one of the main, uh, um, yeah, you know, so counter figures was uh, in the whole assemblage of directors was quite sure Godard. And uh, so this constant uh, idea of rewriting images and so, um, and also Alexander Kluge for the German part, I think, mm -hmm. would be influential at least. Um, there is another question Volker Brandenburg uh, poses, and this is about, I read it, as you started with on the history of labor and also evoked the question of the operational and the two films on Marxism and labor, I would be interested to know how labor relates to those questions. I wonder if writing and filming could be thought of as different forms of labor. This also concerns the question where the Marxism of the early phase goes, speaking of Tretiakov. Okay, thank you, Volker, for that question, um, which you probably know this more than better than I do. But I would say that certainly um, what, I mean, for Faroki, it's been very important to always underscore work and labor and how it is always occluded, whether it is the work of the writer, the work of the craftsman, or the work of the filmmaker. And I'm even thinking here of a film um, such as his film about um, Glazer, who was both the writer and the um, metalsmith maker. And he has Glazer, you see him shaping, it's almost a process film, shaping a metal bowl. I mean, we watch him, how he pounds it rhythmically, but then he also discusses his novels and the amount of time it takes him to think about each individual word. So it's like a craftsmanship that is enacted, both a words craftsman, and we have that expression in English, I don't know if it exists in German, but also a craftsman who wields, who's, who's outside of industrial production. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that labor is also very important in many of his films, such as an, an image um, or a single is being produced on um, the relationship between the time it takes to produce something and then the final product, that disparity, right? So what might end up as being four photographs in an image but it's days and days and hours and hours of painstaking shooting. It's work. There's nothing glamorous or romantic about it. 
or in a single is being produced, much like Godard's one plus one, it's again, how much time is it going to take to make one three minute song? You know, what is the labor behind that? And um, he's very interested in process. And in the two films, I assume that you were referring to something self-explanatory and um, the division of all days. And again, he's trying to figure out, well, how does one show work, show thought processes without it, however, becoming too tedious for the spectator? There's always this going back and forth and this awareness that one has to still somehow keep the spectator hooked or going. So there has to be a kind of a condensation, but how do you condense without rendering labor invisible. Mm -hmm. So I have here some uh, uh, more questions. Uh, interesting enough, uh, some are related um, uh, to each other. Um, so Jonathan Ilman asks, how small can a brick be and still have meaning as a primitive? What are Farrokhi's means of connecting the, the bricks? So this goes maybe to what you, your last point, Nora, um, about this kind of, you know, how are this building up, uh, these films building up and what kind of uh, montage um, is involved there. And um, I just give you the other question so that you can maybe decide what you um, answer first. Um, there's one question that by um, Arta Darzani um, also asking um, for other comparison with filmmakers especially with Trouvé, how he was influenced by them and the significance of his documentary about the making of their class relations. Class relations is his famous film on the Kafka novel. Um, and Frank Trommler asked exactly about um, the audience, especially what, what is about the, can you say more about the audience Farocchi is addressing himself did he consciously addresses different audiences with different techniques? So it's bringing together the question of operational form, so to say, with the address of a public. Okay, well, there are a lot of um, questions here. Um, so just let me, since it's following up from the earlier um, topic, just a brief mention about Straubin Huyer. Um, Farocchi was very influenced by Straubin Huyer. Um, they were very important filmmakers for him. He actually was an actor in Class and Verhältnis. He played the figure of De La Marche. And in his film about their rehearsal process, I mean, this gets back, Gertrude, to your initial evocation of Bach. I mean, he shows through rehearsal and repetition and very careful repetition, but a repetition always with a slight variation that words start to take on different meanings. Um, but also what that film shows is, again, it's the process of work of being an actor, the work of being a filmmaker, repeating the same lines over and over and over again until one gets it just right. Right? And it's very subtle, it's the delivery, it's the subtle shifts and cadences. So yes, um, very influenced by um, Spaubin Huyer. Um, and, you know, Frank, you raise a really important question, who were the audiences for this? And I guess, um, you know, recently in a discussion with Ancho where we were um, talking about the transmission, she found some archives and some folders about the transmission of his telecritique from 1973. And the fact that this was broadcast at 8 p.m. on Westdeutsche Rundfunk, right? So major broadcast that actually hit a lot of people. It was a huge audience. Um, you know, with television, just like with this Zoom lecture, you never quite know who your audience is, who's turning on, who's going to turn off and switch the channel. Um, and that's also, you know, in theaters, 
usually people don't walk out of theaters. There's a little bit of a commitment and you're aware of how many people come to theaters. But in the last iteration of his exhibition form, namely in art exhibitions, it's very different again, right? How are you going to have somebody who's walking through a gallery stop and stay? How long are they going to stop and watch? Will they sit through 20 minutes? Maybe. Will they sit through a full 40 minutes? It's even rarer, right? So you never know how long the audience is going to stay and what is the um, rate then of accessibility afterwards. And something that I should mention is that the Goethe Institute has done a wonderful job of digitizing and making so many of these works accessible to everybody in the past five years. I mean, it's really changed the game of who can um, access these films. So that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, there's a question by Johannes Riedner um, who relates it to the question of the parochias operator. And also, I mean, what kind are there but as he says, sensations, little perceptions, sinnlicher reiz, anschauungszauber. So as operator, does he bring the four, um, this kind of aspect, cinematic aspects? So as operator, can you explain a little, can you explain that term a little bit more, how it's being used as an operator? Um, not... No, it's just uh, uh, as such, parochia as operator. For okay. us to understand reality in all its aspects through science, and I guess uh, so. Maybe as a decoder operator, I I thought it means camera operator. Oh, as a camera operator. Um, well, I mean, he was not always the camera operator. Um, he usually had other people who were operating the camera. I think that um, so, for example. Um, already, even in Ihre Zeitungen, Skip Norman was a, was a cinematographer. Then later, he worked quite a bit with Ingo Kratic. I would say that as operator, he would, for him, I would use less the word operator than editor. Mm -hmm. So I think he takes over the editing process, and that for him becomes the key role mm -hmm. of how to put together the words and the images, and in particular, the images, how to make the arrangements. Um, and, you know, most of us know about the film interface, where he really explains the difference that he has to learn, how he has to learn the whole new skill of going from analog to digital editing and working within those two systems. And what are the implications of that shift? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's another question. Wait a second, I just have to catch up here. Um, yes, so there's another question by Wendy Grantham. And uh, she asked, I mean, um, what do you think uh, Farocchi would have done with all this kind of new instantaneous images like, you know, selfies, food, and so on and so on. Um, and both words and images have been so heavily commodified and enslaved in service of each, of tech and brevity, how might images and words be reclaimed given that we seem to have removed process complete, removed process completely? I mean, it's a question about, you know, it's always a kind of futuristic question because uh, we don't know what the uh, he would have made with this kind of images. Right. Um, so that's an excellent question. And it is one of uh, hypotheses. Um, but given his last work, um, the parallel series, where he was very interested in video games, and if anything, any form is serving tech industries, war industries, um, it's the video game genre. So therefore following along that line and his interest and attempts to sort of decode and to show just how ideologically um, filled those 
images are, I think he probably would have been interested in the phenomena now with memes, with GIFs, uh, and with all other sorts of images that have come to almost make arguments and to speak. Um, the fact that Instagram is just images um, primarily. So it would have been of interest. I don't know what his conclusions are. And it's always difficult to say, well, is it possible to free images? And I mean, one of the um, important things to underscore here is that certainly in the beginning, I mean, Fahoki was not a postmodernism postmodernist. I mean, he did believe in something called truth and something called reality. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to that in today's world, in today's world of the internet, is then a different story. I mean, I don't know if he would have had to shift his thinking, but certainly in the early part, he was a firm believer in documentary reality. Mm, definitely. I think there's a, um, let's say, a, um, a question involved here that maybe goes much more to um, the work Poltansky and Bourdieu have done with this book on uh, photography as illegit illegitimate art, or you know, so where he discusses exactly, I mean, the formation of uh, um, self-representation in the terms of Roland Barthes' uh, language. Uh, that is always spoken through the subject. Mm -hmm. And so the subject becomes this kind of, you know, subordinated, uh, subordinated through this order of uh, um, photography as a sign system of language. So I think uh, there might be other approaches that uh, uh, would refer to the early Farocchi, but maybe not so much to the later Farocchi. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also a question by Beatrice, um, who has a very, I mean, clear question. Uh, could you explain how Benjamin's Denkbild relates to Farocchi's political film art? So this is really for another lecture question, I guess. Um, yeah, that's a huge topic, <laughs> as Catherine said, but um, it relates to what I was starting to tease out towards the end of my lecture of this idea of uh, his proclamation that he wants to make films that think and images that think. So is it possible that systems of thought can be instilled in an image and then further, can those images, when they are placed next to each other, montage next to each other, can they come into an argument with each other. And it's it's important that he mm -hmm. says argument and not conversation. I mean, it is this almost like this idea of the antagonism out of which something else is going to be produced very much in terms of like the antagonistic sphere. But I don't really think we have time to get into, into that too much. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are two questions that again are asking uh, about the relationship or you know affinity discrepancies and so so one comes from Elena Zanichelli um, who wants to uh, uh, now if you could explain more what Farocchi's interest for Antonioni was and the other would be from Arta Varsani again um, can you talk about Fauke's relationship with Christian Petzold in his later years as a writer and perhaps consultant on films like Phoenix and Transit? Was this one of his only encounters with narrative cinema? Um, so unfortunately, I can't really answer Elena. I don't have an adequate answer for Elena's um, mm -hmm. question, just that he was, uh, you know, he wrote a negative review of some Antonioni, but I haven't spent that much time on it. Um, in terms of Petzold, I mean, again, this is a question that people have um, addressed. I mean, I would point you to the book by Jamie Fisher on Christian Petzold, who traces that relationship. Petzold was a student of Farocchi's at the Film Academy. They were very close friends. They collaborated and worked together on many films. Um, 
Now, what you, the second part of the last part of your question, did Falopi ever make a feature? He did. In 1985, he made a feature called um, Betrogen or Betrayed, and it was not successful. There are no obvious reasons um, why it was not successful, um, but it sort of flopped, which I think was a huge disappointment. Um, and to a certain extent, a betrayal for Falofi. And if you look at the film closely, and it's there are some uncanny resemblances, even in the construction of some of the visual shots to some of Petzl's sequences. It's quite amazing to compare the two together. Um, but it was a pretty interesting film, and I think there's a lot to be said about it. Yeah, Nora, I think uh, uh, the last question that is uh, not a question, but a compliment that I only can return um, by Emiliano Cani, who says, thank you for this terrific presentation and insightful talk by Nora. Well, so, and so far, you. I would say this, uh, it's, I think, a nice uh, uh, closing remark. And thank I, you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Gertrude, so much for moderating and keeping everything flowing and your insightful comments. A lot to think about. Thank you both so very much. Thank you, Gertrude, for an excellent moderation. And thank you, Nora, for a fascinating lecture. We learned really, really a lot. And um, <laughs> I'm really glad to um, work at the academy because I can continue talking to you <laughs> every day. <laughs> so um, I have a competitive advantage here. Um, I would um, very warmly invite everyone uh, to our next um, Zoom lecture, which is on April 13 by American Academy alumnus Martin Kuchner. And he will be talking about his uh, latest book, um, The Language of Thieves, the story of Rotwelsch and one's family secret history. Um, and with that, I wish everyone a great evening or a great day, wherever you may be. Bye-bye. <laughs>